Welcome, everyone, to Stories on Stage Sacramento. Great to see you. Uh, we're really excited about uh, this evening, late afternoon's performance, uh, Julie Metz with Eva and Eve, which I just finished, and it's fantastic, and a beautiful feeling book also. It's like relief on the cover, and I just love it. Uh, performed by Julie Anker, and so I will briefly introduce... Uh, I guess we'll call ourselves staff here. I'm Dorothy Rice, co-director, and say hi, Shelly. Hi. Shelly Blanton Stroud mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Jessica Lasky, our uh, casting director. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and Sue Stats, our board member and um, hi, advisor everybody. extraordinaire. <laughs> Great. I will just real briefly go through the agenda for um, all of you out there in Zoom land. So if you haven't been with us before, you know what to expect. Um, Shelly will introduce our author uh, and ask a few questions just to kind of so you get a feel for who Julie Metz is and uh, what the book is about. Uh, and then Jessica will introduce our actor, uh, Julie Anker, who will perform the excerpt. Uh, after which the two Julies, um, coincidentally, uh, will chat about the performance and then we'll open it up to you all for questions and comments. And that's about it. Great, take it away, Shelly. All right, great. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm really thrilled that we've got our two Julies to meet you tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about Julie Matt. She's the author of the recently released World War II and present day memoir, Eva and Eve, and the New York Times best selling memoir, Perfection. She's written on a wide range of women's issues for publications, including the New York Times, Salon, Dame, Tablet, Catapult, Glamour, Next Tribe, and Slice. Julie's a fellow of the Yaddo Corporation, the McDowell Colony, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Vermont Studio Center. She's also the winner of, and this is important, a Literary Death Match, the International Competitive Reading Series founded by Adrian Zuniga. Uh, at that performance, she brought her own sword, so I guess you can see why she won. She's also the art director and cover designer for She Writes Press and Spark Press which is where I first met her. Julie lives with her family in the Hudson River Valley. Welcome, Julie. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, it's so great to be here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the evening. It's uh, such a thrill for an author to hear your book performed, you know, your words performed, so. Uh, I agree. Well, we wanted to start with just three questions for you before we move on to the uh, performance portion of things. So the first one is that, a lot of readers um, might think that a historical memoirist research is almost entirely about reading. And of course, that certainly you know, plays a major role in the work that you've done in order to write this book. But could you tell us a little bit more about the role of physical artifacts, the role they played in your ability to write about the true events in, mm -hmm. this, uh, in this book? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, for me, there were there were three elements to the research. One, as you mentioned, was reading, and the second was travel. Actually, putting my feet on the ground in the places where my mother's family had been, and then the last was this: uh, the importance of what my mother left behind for me, which were uh, photographs, um, her certain items that had been her father's a compass, um, a little set of camping tools that he had used when he went mountain climbing and you know other, uh, even some pieces of jewelry and items like that. And for me, you know, this was a really as, I never met my grandparents. So it was so important to have a tactile experience and just touch something that had been in their hands too. So I kept all those things around me while I was working. And sometimes, you know, I almost, it seems strange to commune with an inanimate object, but I really did feel uh, connected in that way. Yeah. yeah. There's a great um, interview on Radiolab and with the topic of thingness, thingness, about the idea that some people 
almost receive energy from physical objects, whereas others don't. And from reading your book, it really seems like you're someone who reacts to the, the sort of the physics of artifacts. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I consider myself a visual learner. So I really need to have things around me um, when I'm as in my capacity as a designer and art director, but also as a writer. I, it, in some way, they're kind of like talisman, you know, I, mm -hmm. it's sort of good luck charms. And um, if I'm looking for words and can't find them, yeah. I, I sometimes will just play with the objects. Um, I had a one photograph of my grandmother um, whom I never met very sadly. Um, she's in costume. They were in, in Vienna in the 19, you know, 10s, 20s and 30s. Uh, they were costume balls everywhere. They were very popular. And I have one of these, uh, a few photographs of her in costume um, mm -hmm. that I never was able, to, I didn't understand what they were until I showed them to an archivist. And he was like, oh, costume balls, you know. Big <laughs> yeah. But so I always found that uh, I loved this photograph because it it gave me a side of her personality, you know, something kind of whimsical and uh, and and charming. And also, when I looked at the photo under a loop, I could see that she had made the costume herself, which I thought was oh super gosh. cool. So, wow. so in a way, it helped me kind of inhabit a world that was long gone. Yeah. That's great. And you anticipated really my next question in your response about artifacts is that, I mean, I'm assuming there are a good number of writers in here and maybe even writers of memoir. And you mentioned the travel that you did uh, going back to the settings where these things originally took place and also meeting people connected with your family's story. So we're just kind of wondering about that too. How important was travel? How important was it to meet the actual people and not just find out about them or, or to talk to their grandchildren as you, you did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, again, being kind of a visual person, I really, really wanted to go to these places. And it took quite a while to make the connections that helped me sort of, uh, you know, some of the first trip I went in 2012 uh, was I just went to archives, but I didn't really know anybody there. But when I went back in 2019, thank goodness it was 2019 and not a year later. Yeah, yeah. Um, by that point, I had contacts. You know, there were people that I knew, um, including one of the people in the story um, who is among the most colorful, I think, the, the person who helped me find the... Um, the paper fan that I write about in the book. The, the paper fan was, uh, for those who have not read the book yet, was a, a kind of ingenious uh, creation that was used to package powdered medicine during that time before pills had come into use. And my mom had described this for me, but when she described it, I had no idea what she was talking about. I could not imagine it. But when I first encountered this uh, man who now occupies the space where my grandfather had his paper goods factory, I described it for him and he knew what it was right away. And he went and hunted it down. And he also, I found the machine later when I went back in 2019, he took me to the factory where the item is still being made. I found these experiences just incredibly moving and, you know, at a at a, at a cellular level, really for me, very inspiring. And I feel like also just uh, communing with the city itself, you know, the city of Vienna really is a character in my book. And I had so many mixed feelings about Vienna um, because of, I think, uh, the sorrow and bitterness that my mother experienced as an exile. And I wanted to kind of make peace with that. Um, I'm very thrilled to tell you that having waited for two years, I am now officially an Austrian citizen. It's happened, yeah. So just about a week ago, I got this, my brother and I both had applied and we got our acceptance letter. So the next time I go to Vienna, I will have an Austrian passport. And that's, amazing. Me, that's uh, also a very important thing as well. So travel, I think, is a beautiful thing. The other place I went to was Trieste, which was, you know, a city I didn't know much about until I started doing research. 
I loved it so much. It was just a beautiful time uh, spent there. I met such fascinating people. They were all so kind and generous. And um, yeah, I can't wait to go back. So yeah. That's great. Um, we have one more question and that is, uh, I've spent a lot of time talking to Dorothy Rice, uh, who's also a memoirist, about the problem of the shifting nature of memory and interpretation. And, and you're writing, you're writing a historical memoir, but it's also a family memoir. And, and just as Dorothy writes about family and has had to confront the fact that people who were in the room saw it differently, they thought different things happened or did not happen. So how was it for you uh, to confront the fact that you can't really have facts don't necessarily get pinned down clearly? What do you do about that as a memoirist? Well, I really try to address that head on in my book because there, there came a time where I realized that my memory was faulty um, from one trip to another trip that I had just kind of conflated things, you know, in, in a kind of curious and bizarre way. Um, I would say it's, it's so important to really get ahead of that and, and honor the fact that, you know, memory is, is a fuzzy thing. And, you know, in, in my case, I had journals, I had, very careful notes. I had years worth of historical research that I used to to write from. But you know, it's it's always going to be the way you look at it, and someone else in your family that you're writing about might see it very differently. But I think that's kind of the scariest part of writing memoir. Like you worry that you're going to, you know, you know that someone in your family or a close person might disagree with you. But it, I think in that risk, in that risk taking also come the, the greatest rewards mm -hmm. as a writer. That's great. And I know, you know, for the writers in our in our Zoom room, that uh, you've made a point of saying how carefully you wrote down everything you saw, witnessed, perceived. So even if they were, you know, sh your interpretation, you had a record of what you'd seen and and you could assess it that way. Yes, on that last trip in 2019, I, I bought a certain notebook. It was a special size so that I could carry it with me all the time everywhere. And it was very analog, you know, but mm -hmm. I decided this is the way I'm going to do it. So it was all handwritten notes with drawings, sometimes receipts from cafes where I was sitting and any other paper bits that I came upon along the way. And that book I had to carry with me, there was no replacement for it. So that yes. book was with me all the time. And uh, I couldn't put it into any other luggage because that I thought if everything else gets lost, I've got to have this book. And that book uh, remains, you know, on my bookshelf as sort of a record of my writing process. So I'm a big fan of good old fashioned paper. And pencil. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it goes really well thematically with the paper fan and all of the mm -hmm. other artifacts <laughs> that you research. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're so thrilled that you're here, uh, Julie. And, and now I think um, it's time for our casting director, Jessica Lasky, to introduce our actor. Thank you. Oh. I'm very happy to introduce the other Julie. <laughs> Julie Anker is our actor. And I will just give you sort of a brief overview of her bio. Um, which I believe is also on the Stories on Stage Sacramento website. So if you miss anything I say, you can always check there to find out more about Julie. Um, Julie has been an actor for over 25 years in the Sacramento area. So you've probably seen her on stage before. Um, she's a stage actor and company member of Main Street Theater Works, which is in Jackson. And she's been performing with Main Street since 1999. And she's also directed 10 of their productions. It's a really fun experience if you've not been up to Main Street yet. Um, I'm assuming it's in the process of being a place you can go again, um, but it's just a really cool venue. It's outdoors, it's an amphitheater, it's, it's just really fun. So if you haven't gone already, you should, and you'll see Julie. Um, she's also performed at the B Street Theater, Sacramento Theater Company, Capitol Stage, as well as the Hapgood Theater in Antioch. And her other work includes film, most recently Pipe Dream, and she does voiceover work for various clients as well. So you've also probably heard Julie in addition to seeing her. So <laughs> um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, our actor. 
Thank you. Okay. All right, let us begin an excerpt from Eva and Eve. <clears throat> a cassette tape. In 2004, my mother and my uncle Dolphy responded to an interview request from the Leo Beck Institute in New York City. As part of its work as a research center for German speaking Jewry, the Institute sent young non Jewish German and Austrian interns to interview Holocaust survivors. And these interviews then became part of an archive of personal narratives. My mother told me about her interview, and I listened without asking what the experience had meant to her. I wanted to engage, of course, but I was always hesitant to pry into her past. And during that time, I was still preoccupied with the aftermath of my husband's sudden death the year before. My fatherless daughter, and then seven years old, was a necessary focus of my life. My mother did give me a cassette tape of her interview. In 2004, I still owned a tape deck from circa 1985, so I gave it a listen. But the sound quality was so poor that after struggling part of the way through it, I gave up. I didn't want to tell my mother that I hadn't listened to such an important recording. <clears throat> Any further conversations about the interview would involve more white lies than I wanted to attempt. Indeed, I tried to reform my relationship with her since my lying teenage years to avoid even well-intentioned fibs. My apparent lack of curiosity must have disappointed her. Two years later, she was gone. <clears throat> I often thought of that trip to Vienna, wondering why I had never been back or why I'd never gone with her. Her last trip to Vienna was with my father in 1996. I wondered if I might have been able to persuade her to visit her home at 22 Weimarha Strasse, if only. But now I was left with the keepsake book, her jewelry, her father's folding utensils in their crumbling leather pouch, photographs, and the other paper documents, all of them filled with too many mysteries. Time passed in a swirl of family life and work. Liza left grade school for middle school and then high school. In the summer of 2010, Clark and I moved to a new Brooklyn apartment, and in the purge of relocation, I unloaded my tape deck. My mother's cassette was now a historical artifact, part of the landscape on the shelf above my desk. Pens, tape dispenser, a box of staples, photos of Liza, notebooks and reference books. Soon, a veiled soon veiled in a layer of the fine black dust that coats windowsills and all other stationary objects in New York City, the clear plastic case took on a cloak of invisibility. That is, until one day, more than a year after our move, my eye settled upon it. A friend with access to a professional editing suite offered to transfer the recording to CD. She improved the sound quality enough that I could finally listen to the interview from beginning to end. The first thing I noticed was her accent. I'd always thought of my parents as quintessential New, York New Yorkers. They always talked like New Yorkers, cutting each other off, finishing each other's sentences. This was how any family conversation progressed in volatile spurts and nonlinear tangents, for we were all quick tempered. My father had long ago tossed off his native Philadelphia sing song for the cadence of Manhattan, peppered liberally with Yiddish. I would have described my mother's voice as Upper West Side Ease, the American English of an educated woman with some elongation of vowels that hinted at her European background, but so subtle it would have taken Professor Henry Higgins to correctly map her origins. And yet the first thing I heard on the recording was her melodic Viennese accent. Had she always spoken like this? Had her accent been more pronounced in the interview because she was talking to a young Austrian man? Had she intentionally called it forth to remind the young man, no doubt the grandson of national socialists, that his aunt, what his ancestors had done to her family? As a child, I wanted her to be like all the other moms of my classmates. Perhaps I simply heard what I wanted to hear. The interview included stories my mother had always told us, but there were new details that I'd never heard. The unnamed young man who interviewed her was patient allowing her to unfold her narrative. For the first time since my mother had given me the cassette tape, I read the fine print on the box and contacted the Leo Beck Institute. Michael Simonson, one of their archivists, 
invited me to visit their library. When I described the keepsake book, he smiled and told me that the archive had many Posey albums, like the one my mother had hidden in her drawer. I listened to a number of recordings made by other refugees, including my uncles, all of which began to create an impression of what life had been like for Viennese Jews before the Nazis seized power in March 1938, before the terrifying changes that quickly followed. <clears throat> Michael gave me a long reading list and email addresses of various archives in faraway Vienna, including a high placed administrator at the Austrian archives named Dr. Hubert Steiner, the head of Vermögenswey Kersteller or Jewish Property Declaration Office. Michael said that Dr. Steiner would be able to provide information about my grandfather's paper good business, the factory located behind the residential building at 22 Weimarhastrasse that had produced the mysterious item made of folded paper my mother had described so often. It was early April 2012 when I wrote to Dr. Steiner requesting information about the business and bank accounts the Nazis had taken away from my grandfather Julius as part of the Arianization of Jewish property following the Anschluss. Two replies came from Vienna sooner than I expected. The first from Dr. Hubert Steiner's official Ar Austrian archive email address was a formal acknowledgement of my inquiry. My request would be filed as soon as possible, he wrote, according to the huge backlog. My grandfather's file number was 32144. The second reply came from Hubert Steiner's personal email address. In stilted, stilted but curiously poetic English, he described his struggles over the 25 years of his career to get the Austrian government to fully acknowledge and address the past crimes of National Socialism. He wrote that he would personally photocopy and mail the documents I'd requested, as the bureaucracy involved in doing otherwise would have resulted in many months of delay. He told me how beautiful Vienna was in the spring with, his, with cherry trees in bloom. He hoped that I would visit and reacquaint myself with my mother's city. He said that sometimes he felt a need for outside correspondence as the work he was doing at the archives weighed heavily on him. Would I be agreeable to a correspondence? I read his email many times trying to parse the tone. Guilt, frustration, loneliness? His email closed, dear greetings from spring like Vienna sends you. With the verb at the end, as in a German sentence, the disordered English syntax reminded me of an E.E. E. Cummings verse. The email was signed, Hubert. Soon a heavy cardboard box that had originally held reams of Austrian photocopy paper arrived at my Brooklyn apartment, containing precisely, according to the follow-up email from Hubert, 843 pages related to Julius Singer's printing factory, Adolf Eisenmann und Sohn. An official letter was enclosed with the documents on the letterhead of the Austrian archives. I leafed through the pages. I couldn't read most of the text, but I could figure out the gist, the transfer of bank accounts and insurance policies, the forced sale of his company. The dates were all from July, 1938, just months after the Anschluss. This same ritual of choreographed bureaucracy had been happening all over Vienna with breathtaking efficiency. It was important to the Nazis that the Arianization of Jewish property had the appearance of legitimacy rather than the theft that it truly was. Julius Singer had penned his elegant signature on each document. So much paper. After Julius signed away his business in the summer of 1938, what had the Singer family left to live on during the time between mid-1938 and March 25, 1940, the exit date on their passports? Those two missing years haunted me. There was no one left who could tell me what that time must have been like for my mother, Eva, a young girl from ages 10 to 12. Dear greetings from Spring Lake, Vienna sends you. It was now mid-April. The cherry trees in Prospect Park were wrapping up their yearly spring display, scattering miniature pink tutus over fresh green lawns. One morning, I opened up the box, flipped through the pages as I'd done so many times, and knew right then that I needed to return to Vienna. Another visit to the old country. June 2012. 
Liza and I were on an evening flight to Vienna via Austrian air, per my father's recommendation. Excellent service, more food more than edible. Though I knew his, this choice would have been troubling to my mother who never wanted to purchase anything made by the country that had expelled her. I'd arranged this week as a research trip with plans to visit several Jewish historical archives and to walk the streets of my mother's city again. It was most curious to meet, I was most curious to meet Hubert Steiner, my mysterious correspondent at the Austrian archives. Liza was 15. We were sullen travel companions. I told myself I was bringing her along to show her our family history. Her summer school vacation had already begun, long days without structure until a summer art class in July. After more than two decades as part of the administration at the Cooper Union, Clark was now in the midst of a career reinvention as part of the fallout from the 2008 recession and needed workday time to focus. A trip together seemed like a good idea in April, but I could see already that I hadn't planned this very well. As part of, as we prepared for takeoff, Liza and I were not speaking. What had begun as a mother-daughter brush fire in the morning had burned hot and out of control by midday, gobbling up the plentiful fuel of resentment left over from previous fights over curfews and allowance. Even as the tension had escalated, I could not remember how it all started. Despite my nagging, she would not fill her suitcase. I was an anxious traveler, she knew that. She'd even threatened to stay behind. I'd actually considered that option, though it would have meant forfeiting both her airfare and the hope I'd had of some kind of bonding experience in the old country. At last, with Clark's guidance, we reached a wary truce. Clark escorted us to the waiting taxi and we rode in silence to JFK. As we shuffled through security, I smiled at the gray plastic bin holding Liza's ragged black Converse high tops as it jerked along the conveyor belt and into the belly of the scanner. Those sneakers perfectly captured her current aesthetic. Most of her clothing was black and had at least one hole in it. How oh, my mother hated my similar phase of tattered army navy clothing. She repeatedly threw out one of my favorite shirts and I would fish it out of the trash and wear it the next day. I promised myself I would never comment on Liza's clothing. There was plenty of other stuff for us to fight about, especially late night hanging out at Prospect Park in the area where kids drank illegally purchased cheap liquor and smoked a lot of weed. We knew we only had the dimmest idea of what was really happening, despite our attempts to track her phone. She caught on to that quickly. Mothering a teenager felt so stupid and futile, despite my best attempts. I feared I was turning into my mother. A ghostly image of the sneakers appeared briefly on the screen, fully detected, inspected, ejected. As we hustled toward the gates, the gate, Liza declined my admittedly pathetic attempt to win her over by getting her a Starbucks chai latte. As soon as we were seated, she popped in her headphones. Squished next to the window as far away from me as the narrow space would permit, Liza let me know that she would have been happy to stay in Brooklyn. Message received, loud and clear. I felt sorry already about the fight we'd had earlier in the day. Her black Converse sneakers tossed on the carpeted floor seemed to be laughing at me for even trying to understand my daughter and her teenage misery. As I thought back to the morning, I saw now how a few ill-timed judgy words from me had sent a tense moment into overdrive. We were both stubborn as hell. On good days, I was proud of her self-determination. On days like today, I felt like an abject failure. It had been just like this when I was Liza's age, fighting with my mother over clothes and curfews, a fact that made me cringe. I pretended to read a magazine as I attempted to remember what had even caused this latest fight. I tried to stay calm, determined to repair the damage during the next precious week. I hated when I felt like I was turning into my mother. Hated it. Liza and I traveled together to Europe seven years earlier, the June following her father's death. She had still been a child then, one who was never bored and could find delight in so many things, despite the loss that had up upended our lives. This is when travel had become stressful for me, where once it had been all carefree adventure, but she was happy to be with me and forgave my schedule snafus, my anxious fumbling for tickets and passports. 
on the plus side. She relished the endless ice creams and fancy meals in Paris and Florence. But now Liza was a teenager. Time spent with her mother was occasionally a source of delight, many petties, but mostly a battle of wills. I thought about my mother as we lifted off into the night sky and the sparkling towers of New York City faded under the mauve blanket of summer haze. My mother deserved a sincere apology, wherever she was now. I also thought about the joint wrapped in two layers of tinfoil, hidden in an empty medicine vial, camouflaged among my toiletries. Tufts of bud from my last season's modest crop raised beneath branches of prickly rose bush and clematis in my Brooklyn backyard. Why had I planted weed in my garden? Because I was tired of fighting with my weed smoking kid, tired of pretending that I hadn't done the same when I was her age. According to my teenage diaries, which made for a humbling reread, I had gotten stoned almost every miserable day of high school. The plants in my garden were like a white truce flag. Turned out Liza's sense of rebellion was contagious. The flight attendant arrived with the drink and snack cart. Liza ordered a Coke. I never stocked soda at home, being a Park Slope food co-op mama. Liza's headphones were still on. I could hear the muffled refrain of the band's The Wait. Could Clark and I at least take some credit for her excellent music taste? Would someone take this load of epic parental fail off me? I sipped a tomato juice, my preferred in-flight drink, wallowing in self-pity. The flight attendant returned with meals, surprisingly edible, just as my father had promised. We cut and chewed in silence. Later, I watched with envy as Liza dozed off to the drone of the engines and the sway of transatlantic turbulence. I have never been able to sleep on planes. I knew I was doomed to watch at least two terrible movies I would never remember later and arrive in Vienna haggard and unhinged with deprivation. In the sparkling Vienna airport, I hovered outside my body, sunlight too bright, all sounds and assault, desperate for a bed in a quiet room. Only the fuel of maternal anxiety kept me on task. Liza and I boarded one of the efficient high-speed trains into the city, merging onto a street near the apartment I'd rented online. There was no trash anywhere, not even a stray cigarette butt, though plenty of passerbys were smoking. The street was quiet, just a few pe biz people busy with their everyday doings. As I searched for the number of the house where we would stay in the city I no longer recognized from my previous time here, I wondered again why I had never been brave enough to suggest a trip with my mother. Liza and I arrived at the apartment building and the woman with whom I had corresponded online was waiting for us. She sent us upstairs with our luggage in a tiny elevator, the same size as the one I remembered at 22 Weimar Hastrasse. On our floor, she opened the door to a clean, well-appointed studio apartment, very Ikea the universal decor choice of economy price short-term rentals. She asked why we were in Vienna and I briefly explained my research mission. I am not Jewish, she said, but I married a Jewish man. I converted, we're raising our children Jewish. Really, I replied, genuinely surprised. She told me about their reform synagogue, which sounded welcoming and open-minded. How many Jews are there in Vienna, I asked. About 900, she replied, something like that. Some people hid here during the war, but most of the people who could get out never came back. And of course, most didn't get out at all. I'd read that the pre-war Jewish population was around 200,000 in a city of roughly 2 million. The 10% of the population had had an outsized impact on the cultural life in Austria before the war. And now there were so few Jews left there had been Mr. Weiss all those years ago, and now I'd found another one, a convert no less. She described the friendly Sabbath services at her synagogue, ex extending an invitation. I experienced the faintest twinge of guilt that this woman probably knew more about Judaism than I did. After our ho host left, Liza and I began to unpack. I was feeling quite smug that the TSA sniffer dogs hadn't found my joint. I shared my smugness with Liza, hoping we might bond over sticking it to the man, <laughs> but no. 
I'm still mad at you, she reminded me. She softened the next day, nothing like a table in the sun at the beautifully preserved Café Prukel, plus an endless supply of Café Mochas piled with clouds of schlag, whipped cream, Salads arranged like formal gardens and decadent suites served by unhurried waiters to cheer up even the most righteously grumpy teenager. She took charge of our corner table and opened a fat book she'd brought with her, an anthology of five novels by Kurt Vonnegut. Once we, were ori once we oriented, ourse oriented, oriented ourselves, I bought Lisa a cell phone and then rushed to my first appointment with a researcher named Elizabeth Plamper of the DOEW, the Documentation Center of Austrian, Austrian Resistance. The goal of this organization founded by former members of the resistance and refugees, was to educate on the history of Nazism in Austria, as well as monitor right-wing activities in the present. Alarmingly, in 2012, the rise of right-wing parties in this already conservative country was significant. Liza was free to wander the area near the Stadtpark for a few hours till dinner. I had the impression when we reconnected that she'd managed to score some weed, which must have taken some doing as she did not speak a word of German. One afternoon, we went together to the Café de Mal where we ordered coffees, a fruit tart, and a slice of chocolate tort. We watched an older woman consume a full meal, followed by a slab of cake big enough to feed three. She looked like a regular. We agreed that there were worse ways to live than to eat at this cafe once a week. At the Leopold Museum in the center of Vienna, Liza and I admired the portraits by Gustav Klimt, where enchanted women peered out through glittering mosaic patterns of gold and jewel colors. We were especially drawn to the more aesthetic drawings of Klimt's, uh, drawings and paintings of Klimt's follower, Egon Schiele, who created his images of women and his own naked body against plain paper or canvas. The colors of the figures were vividly pure, the effect at once tenderly sensual and acidic. Schiele's vigorous, anguished lines told the truth of his fearless personal inquisition in a vocabulary Liza understood immediately as I had when I first encountered his work as a young woman. After we left the museum with a shopping bag of postcards and a book on Sheila's paintings, she showed me a silk scarf printed with Gustav Klimt's The Kiss, one I hadn't paid for. It's for you, she said, for your birthday. Number 53 was coming up soon. I chose to be touched rather than upset that she'd shoplifted. After all, I had hidden my joint, so she and I were not so different. Also, the fucking Austrians owned my, owed my family more than they had ever repaid and ever could repay. They should buy me a scarf for my birthday. We traveled by train to Tiergarten Schonbrunn. After strolling through the meticulous gardenscapes and lush greenhouses, we made our way to the outdoor animal exhibits. Overwhelmed by their adorable faces, Liza nearly tumbled into an exhibit of prairie dogs. I was relieved to see her so engaged and happy. On another afternoon, warm and faintly humid, we joined the crowd cheering marchers at the gay pride parade at the Ringstrasse, the wide circular boulevard that surrounded the center of Vienna, lined with former mansions, including the Albert Rothschild's palace. Place, palace. After its Jewish owners, members of the far-flung Rothschild's banking family were expelled following the Anschluss in 1938 and its vast art holdings seized. The Nazi Gestapo had taken over its headquarters. Adolf Eisenman set up the Central Agency for Jewish Immigration at the, in the same building. This was where Jews, including my grandfather Julius, lined up day after day to apply for passports and exit permits in return for surrendering their assets. There was nothing ominous about the mood today on the Ringstrasse. The parade was as gaudy and ruckus as New York City's pride back home with a long stream of marches and floats bearing costume men and women dancing and singing along to, I will survive and we are the champions. In such an outwardly staged city where I always felt other, I began to find some ease and even delight. The Leo Beck Institute in New York had arranged for us to tour the old Jewish quarter with an Austrian research colleague. 
Johann was not Jewish, but had devoted himself to the study of Jewish history in Vienna. A kind of penance, he said, to honor the dead and those who were forced to flee. He promised us a lunch at the end of our tour, the best falafel in town. Where did your parents spend the war years, I asked him. Johann told me without a hesitation that his family members had been in the Nazi party in a small town outside Vienna. None of the archivists I met during this week was a Jew. I thought back to Mr. Weiss, imagining that the few Jewish returnees would be mostly older people like him, who would want to live as unburdened by the past as possible. For those who committed themselves to this work of excavation and preservation, there was a continual reckoning and repentance, even as a prevailing culture in Austria tried to move past the time of its full embrace of national socialism. Many of Austria's media and politicians still referred to their country as the first victim of Hitler's aggressions. The photographic and film evidence as well as witness accounts contradicted this narrative. The Austro-fascist government led by Chancellor Kurt Schönschlig cap capitulated to Hitler's demand for Anschluss or reunification. Footage from March 12, 1938 showed crowds of Austrians welcoming Hitler across the German bo border like a celebrity. Ye women young and old screamed with tears in their eyes, waving flags and handkerchiefs. On March 15, Crowds in Vienna raised their arms in fascist salute to the lines of regimented Nazi soldiers parading on the Heldenplatz, the square of heroes. By the time an April 1938 plebiscite ratified the national takeover, Austria had already been negated as a sovereign nation. Johann represented an important segment of the younger Austrian population, motivated by a strong desire to reject the revisionism of the post-war decades, to finally get right with history. As we began our walking tour, he pointed out a blockish post-war building. This had once been the location of the Grand Hotel Metropole, bombed at the end of the war. After the 1938 Anschluss, Hitler sent Adolf Eisenmann, into Vienna to manage the Jewish problem. Eisenman set up offices at the Metropole because it was close to, to the Israelischer Kutzgemeinde, Jewish Community Center, and known as the IKG, where all records of Viennese Jews were stored, names, addresses, births, marriages, deaths. Johann pointed out that the only synagogue spared during the Kiskelnacht was the, not the Night of Broken Glass, the brutal Nazi sanctioned pogrom that took place from November 9th through 10th, 1938, was a large central synagogue tucked discreetly on a narrow side street. This temple backed up onto the offices of the IKG. Eisenman wanted the IKG records preserved to keep track of the Jewish population in exquisite detail so that he could identify and ultimately remove every last one. In 1938, the goal of the Nazi party was to strip Jews of their money and property and then expel them to any country that would take them. Later, that goal would change, in large part because Jew Jews could not find countries that would accept them. When forced immigration failed, the Nazi strateg strategy shifted to extermination. Johann took us to the Jodenplatz, a beautiful square with buildings dating to medieval period and the Jewish Memorial and Museum. Though Jews were at times tolerated, even protected by various rulers, including some of the Habsburgs, they were confined to the central ghetto area. Later assimilation allowed Jews with enough means, like my mother's family, to move into other districts of the city. Frequent and brutal purges of Jews took place throughout the city's history. Johann led us to the center of the square, site of the Holocaust Memorial and pointed to a plaque mounted on the facade of a narrow white building from centuries earlier, proclaiming that Vienna had been cleansed of Jews. The building with its offensive plaque now housed a gallery on the ground floor that featured artwork on the subject of the Holocaust and other human rights issues. The plaque, the gallery, and the museum these contrasts spoke to the tension I felt walking through Vienna that I'd also experienced as a young woman on my earlier trip in 1980. I was a 
small dark haired Jewess surrounded everywhere by tall Aryans. Even here, walking in the streets and squares of the former Jewish ghetto, I felt like my people were too small in number to be anything but unwelcomed oddity. My sense of otherness made me want to howl out loud with both defiant joy and fury. One night, when Liza and I were back in our apartment after walking home on the dark and easy streets, I rummaged in my toiletry bag for the foil line, foil wrap joint. Let's go sit outside, I said. Liza and I made our way to the rear courtyard of the apartment building, where I lit up with matches from Cafe de Mel. We inhaled, passing the joint back and forth in silence. My mouth pulled up into a smile. I started laughing an involuntary snortle. Liza looked at me with curiosity. This was a first. And geez, this was pretty good for homegrown. The gentle stuff that didn't make you paranoid. I wanted a brownie, big time. Oh, or some of the dense chocolate torte from DeMel. I took a quick mental inventory of the extraordinary leftovers in our fridge upstairs. In the courtyard, the night sky was clear ultramarine. The moonlit walls of the courtyard enclosed us, glowing as if phosphorescent. Liza expertly snuffed the played joint with her fingers. I wondered what we would make of this week in Vienna once we got home. For now, I was glad we were together and safe. Liza and I left the following afternoon. I closed the door to the Ikea apartment. We squeezed our bodies and bags into the elevator that creaked and groaned on its way to the lobby. I dropped the key into our host's mailbox and in a few steps we were outside on the bright street walking to the subway. Liza wanted to be home again. I was also ready to leave Vienna, but I knew I would return. Soon we were back on the high speed train whizzing through the tidy suburbs and industrial exurbs. In our luggage were souvenirs, the filch scarf, a box of candy violets from Cafe de Mel, two dresses, dresses I'd bought for us at a small boutique on the street of the Ikea apartment. On my iPhone were photos of Liza in the Stadtpark, the Cafe de Mel and the zoo. I'd also taken one photo of the gargoyled front doorway of my mother's house at 22 Weimarer Strasse. It was a blinding hot Saturday afternoon when we went there by tram. I got lost and when I finally found the street, we were both so exhausted and parched. Somehow I had forgotten to buy a bottle of water. The great wooden front door was locked tight. Someone else's name was listed at the apartment number five. No Mr. Weiss and daughter, no manor wafers. I wondered if Mr. Weiss could possibly still be alive somewhere else in the city. I rang some buzzers, no one answered. I hadn't planned this well. I took a photo of the building directory mounted next to the front door. One of the occupants appeared to be a film company. As we made ourselves com comfortable in our Austrian airline seats, I made a note to write to the film company for access next time when I returned. And then I needed to find those missing documents, the ones that should have been at the IKG, though I had no idea where to search. Liza put on her headphones. My mother's city faded as the plane pierced the clouds. Oh. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Lovely. You handled that German really well. Well, yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah it's tough. It's tough. It's yeah. Google Translate and it's phonetics and it's talking to my German cousin and yeah. I, I did oh, I wow. Did. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a tricky thing, right? Because yeah. uh, hopefully you know, I did there's I got a lot of German in there. There's yeah. a lot of, and I still don't speak German. But <laughs> there's something to look forward to, though, right? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. One of the things that was striking me by watching you, Julie, was that, like, that process of acting, you had to, when you saw the German words, you had to think about getting, anybody would have to think about getting the word right. Is it hard to keep performing, keep your head in Julie Met? while you're thinking about the word pronunciation? 
Um, yeah, I mean, sure, because you want to do it, you know, you want to do it justice. Mm -hmm. And on my script, you know, all those German words were highlighted in yellow. So as I'm reading, you know, my brain is like, uh oh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> Here comes the German, here comes the German, don't screw it up. So, you know, yes, a little bit of that, but I, I tried to just stay in that moment. And I thought, you know what, you do the best you can and move on. And so mm -hmm. hopefully I was able to hang on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting because there's actually, um, uh, the Viennese accent is different from the German that oh, most it? people learn. Um, a Viennese accent is much softer, more in a way, ironically, the way you pronounced it. Oh. Um, so standard German has a lot of harder syllables, but uh, I, I didn't understand the difference at all until many years ago when I was in college, a German friend came home with me for a holiday for Thanksgiving and he and my mom started talking to each other. And uh, afterwards he told me how much he'd enjoyed my mother's Viennese accent. And I'd never, it never had occurred to me that there was anything different about it, but it's sort of uh, got some French inflection and a softer, sort of softer sound. Yeah, it seems like it's yeah. a little softer than, yeah, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. My mother was German and mm -hmm. I wish she had spoken German to, to us. The only time I heard her really speak German when she was talking to my grandmother and telling her what she got us for Christmas. So we didn't know. Um, so, you know, other than that. So, um, but yeah, there's, it's more of a guttural kind of sound that comes yeah. to it. Um, yeah. But my, I would hear my mom and my mom also didn't teach us German either, but I would hear her speaking German to an elderly relative. And then when we went to the butcher together, the butcher was German, and I think she she would haggle with him over <laughs> prices. There you go. Prices in uh, in German. That's so awesome. that was sort of her secret weapon. You know, that's a wonderful very, question cool. from. Yeah. Um, we have a great question from Anara. Um, mm. Would like to know how you feel about becoming a dual citizen. Uh, how that feels? Uh, I. It's so complicated. It, it there's so many emotions. Um, the process of waiting for the opportunity to apply and then just going through all the paperwork. It, it took several years. Um, I feel a lot of feelings. It's um, a feeling of justice and restitution. And also, uh, weirdly, I feel kind of whole, you know, because I feel like there was a, a part, a part of my, you know, my inner core that, that needed to be honored. And so I feel like, uh, you know, I grew up in New York. I'm very New Yorkish, <laughs> um, but I also feel kind of European. And so now that part is, uh, is you know, is sort of uh, has a document. Yeah, so, and it yeah. Bring back that connection with your mother as well. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Ruth, yeah. Ruth, you have a question. Yeah, actually, it's not a question. I want to add to that as the daughter of two Viennese refugees who fled mm -hmm. in 38. And I became an Austrian citizen as soon as one could, which was, I don't know, maybe it's 20 years ago now, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And I remember my father was alive then and he thought I was completely bonkers. He had no interest at all, but I felt that it was kind of um, an up yours. Mm -hmm. from, you, know, you took it away from my parents. Now I'm going to have it. Um, and there were a lot of other issues too, but mm -hmm. one of them was, I admit this, and it's kind of ironic, it felt like an insurance policy in mm -hmm. case I ever had to leave this country. Mm -hmm. I know, well, that's how it sort of feels now. The, the issue was the reason why I couldn't apply when, when you know, many years ago when you did, is that um, they, the law had been written in a way that there was a, a year cutoff. Um, they, they sort of changed the law at a certain point. And the year when they changed that law, I was in college and I just wasn't really focused on it. Um, and so I didn't apply in time. If, you're, if both parents weren't Austrian, then you couldn't apply. But what they did was yeah. about th two, three years ago, they changed the law so that even if you just had one parent, you could apply. Mm -hmm. And this was, and also that you could keep your 
American citizenship so you can become a dual citizen. So, yeah. And interestingly, in the beginning, it had to be your father. Your father, your right, right, you that's right. Been a, an Austrian citizen in 1936. That's right, that's and exactly right. changing it over the Yeah, year. yeah. I think, you know, I'm going to say that they, you know, the law was written in a way to limit acknowledgement and responsibility. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Shelley's asking how your daughter feels about her Viennese heritage. Yeah, that's also complicated. Um, you know, my, my daughter is uh, a quarter Korean, um, then part of, you know, half Jewish. So there's the Russian Jews and the Austrian Jews. And I think that, you know, I think, I think she kind of is into this whole mishmash, but um, I'm very much hoping that she will take advantage because the law also changed that they're accepting the next generation. Oh. So she can apply and then of course, pass that onward. So it really is uh, for me, um, back to the up yours uh, comment that Ruth made is that there, there, uh, there are about 10,000 Jews in Vienna now most of them, the, there are very, very few who are related to the original, to that pre, pre-war population. Most come from Russia, uh, uh, as, as it happens. But this law, there are people applying from everywhere. So from all the diaspora, people are applying from Canada, the United States, South Africa, South America, Australia. And there's, there's actually a Facebook page that I've joined that where people kind of share their process on this. So I don't think the Austrian government quite understood what was going to happen, that a lot of people feel this way. Like they want to be, they want to have this part of your ancestry honored and, um, you know, health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I do actually, especially uh, I will say during the last presidential administration, there were times when I thought, wouldn't it just be crazy if I felt like I had to leave and go back to the country that kicked my mother out? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, Vienna actually is, is very much a, um, a democratic socialist city, as it was in the 1930s, very progressive, they have very progressive housing policies. And of course, you know, healthcare for everybody. Um, and so the, the rest of Austria is quite conservative, but Vienna has always been a very progressive town. Yeah. And it's much cooler now than it was when I first went there. <laughs> much more, much more lively. You see a lot more um, uh, kind of different populations, immigrants. It's much, just much more, uh, it feels much more like a city and less of a museum. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that dual citizenship is a gift. I mm -hmm. don't want you to miss, uh, uh, Julie, the, the comments in, in the chat. Oh, yes. Okay. Lovely yeah. writing, lovely reading. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from Deborah, beautiful writing, excellent reading. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't want you to miss those. Yeah, well, thank you. It's really such a pleasure to hear words performed when I'm writing. I often read to my, you know, talk to myself. I'm sure a lot of you can relate the writers out there in the audience um, that you sort of read it aloud uh, and sound like a crazy person. Or, and so I really enjoyed the, um, the way Julie read the passage where I'm traveling with my daughter. Um, <laughs> I did ask permission to include. I was gonna say, is that all true stuff? Yep, that's all true. <laughs> that's awesome. And, uh, it's all true. <laughs> Pretty much it's verbatim <laughs> because I had, you know, I had a notebook then too. Sure. But um, yeah, so it was, um, uh, I, I asked my daughter if it'd be okay to include that scene um, because in a way I, I felt like that was sort of, um, you know, my own relationship with my mother was very complicated and we had a lot of those kind of moments. Yeah. So I, the sort of uh, the circles coming coming around were, were very important in my story. 
Um, but, I, I thought I found that so enjoyable to read because I'm a parent. My kids are, older, <laughs> but you know, I I know those moments. You're like, ah, oh, I just I need to get through the teenage years. Yeah. But, and then it ends up being a beautiful thing. So yeah, you know. I know it's it's funny because now my daughter's 25, young adult. Mm -hmm. We have a very different relationship. It's so like we got through it and it's okay. Yeah. So all those parents out there who have teenagers, Hang in there. this will pass. <laughs> but, um, but I do like to think that that trip, you know, did give her a taste that, you know, there's this other part of yourself and you yeah. can belong here. Like this place could be yours, you know, so... Yeah, I can't imagine she wouldn't have uh, that. That yeah. would have sunk into her some, you know. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's awesome. I it was, it was um, very. I, I really enjoyed doing the reading, and um, thank you for the opportunity. And just thank you for inviting me to do this. Yeah. And I hope I I hope I did it justice for you. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a thank you, <laughs> Myers. Thank you so much. Inspiring. Is there one last question from anyone? No, wonderful. Yes, wonderful performance. I love the excerpt. Yeah, uh, just um, a few brief announcements. Number one, thank you, everyone. Uh, hope you come back in October for David Whedon, uh, Native American author. And the book's title is Winter. Is it just winter? No. Winter Counts. Winter Counts, David Whedon. So it's wonderful. And follow Julie on Instagram at Julie Metz Writer. Mm -hmm. right at julie yeah. Metz and then my website if if people are interested in uh um there's a lot of uh cool photographs and you know archival photographs and and uh objects that are on the website and you can um so you can get a little flavor of uh of the vienna that i experienced when i Absolutely. traveled there and all the links for purchasing the book are there mm -hmm. as well uh of course here Thank in you. sacramento we, we push capital books but wherever you're located uh mm -hmm. go to our website or go to your local bookstore and they can order it for you if they don't have it it's a wonderful book a beautiful book um too yes well. physically i mean they did such a beautiful job with the design it's really lovely yeah, I, it's a work I, of art. I enjoy <laughs> looking at it every day I so yeah thanks yeah. Uh, and thanks to all the writers out there for attending and, and for supporting this program, which is so wonderful. Yeah. And I have and to put in a plug for our own anthology, 2020, uh, 43 Stories from a Year Like No Other, also available from Capital Books or any uh, of your online places where you buy books, order from any bookstore. Uh, it helps support our programs because we are a nonprofit uh, and any money we make off the book, which at the moment is none, but if we ever do, it, it will just help us bring more wonderful authors and actors to stories on stage. So thanks for your support. And uh, thank you both Julie's uh, and yeah. everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh yeah, Sue Stats says one of the most wonderful things about the book is the photos. Uh, so yeah. buy the book if you can. It, it yeah. really is a beautiful object yeah. in addition to the writing. I'll uh, jump in there too to add one thing without permission, and that is that um, Julie Metz makes an amazing book club guest. Uh, her book makes a great topic for book club discussion, mm -hmm. and she visited our book club, and everyone was fell in love with Julie Metz, and are now big big fans. So oh, keep that's that in so mind. Great. <laughs> yeah, I do love doing work with book clubs and um, there's going to be a paperback edition coming out in May. I know that um, May 2022, I know that most book clubs, you know, or many book clubs like to buy soft covers. So um, you can reach out to me at my website and I'd love to visit with you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Julie's. Thank, Thank you to the Julie's. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>